So, resuming now, and uh, we are going to hear a few papers, we, which this time will be more by lawyers. But this, nobody's perfect. But uh, this do, does not impede trying and continue having some interdisciplinary uh, discussions. Now we have uh, Dacian Dragos and Bogdana Neamtu who are presenting uh, a paper which will certainly become a chapter of the book on ombudsprudence as a source of law and of good behavior, the case of transparency and participation. Ombudsprudence is a nice word in English. The big problem is when you start to put it in other languages. We French are very lazy. We say la jurisprudence du médiateur, which is fine also. Uh, I don't know if it's Darcian or Bogdana who speaks. Bogdana. I'm a sociologist who's been working on legal issues uh, pertaining to transparency, good governance, uh, ombudsman institutions, but again, I'm not a lawyer, so <laughs> uh, hopefully in combination with, with my colleague, this will prove to be an inspired combination. Uh, the topic that we are going to discuss today uh, has to do with the ombudsprudence of the European Ombudsman, free access to documents. Um, we chose this topic mainly because of two reasons. Um, in our opinion, it's highly relevant. 20 to 30 percent of the complaints that are addressed to the European Ombudsman have to do with um, access to documents. Also, in the last years, together with my colleague, we've been trying to uh, look at the ombudsprudence of various ombuds, national ombudsmen from Central and Eastern Europe, and this has proved to be a very frustrating endeavor at times, mainly because it's very hard to get access to the full decisions published uh, <coughs> online. So um, in this respect, the European ombudsman proved to be um, the perfect uh, occasion for this research. Uh, what we tried uh, to do was to conduct an empirical um, research into the norms of good administrations <laughs> that are employed by the European Ombudsman in the field of free access uh, to documents. The research uh, had a twofold goal. First, we, are, we were interested in seeing whether the European Ombudsman is involved in the creation of good norms uh, of, good, uh, of norms of good administration in this field. There are um, authors who argue that the European Ombudsman should be involved, others arguing that the institution is already uh, doing this. The second step, which is more of a challenge, implied making an inventory of the norms of good administration developed um, by the European Ombudsman in the field. There are studies um, done with a similar methodology, and uh, one of the recent ones, it's in the field of uh, public uh, procurement, public tenders. I will not spend a lot of time discussing um, details about uh, the role and function of the European Ombudsman, but there are a couple of um, distinctions that are important in light of our research. First of all, we have to keep in mind the fact that when ombudsman institutions have been created in various parts of the world, um, they were created with different purposes. And these different purposes also imply different choices with regard to um, what the ombudsman reviews or, and more importantly, how he conducts um, the investigation. I would only make two um, differences, or I would stress two differences. We can look at ombudsman institutions either as control mechanisms or redress mechanisms. And another difference that it's important in light of our research, 
is whether or not uh, the Ombudsman has a mandate that uh, is outside the competence of existing supervising mechanisms or whether the mandate overlap with the mandate of the courts, uh, generally speaking. Why these distinctions are important? Because from the literature, what we observed is that uh, uh, it's usually the countries or the national uh, legal regime where ombudsman institutions are perceived as creators of good administration norms are usually those countries where the ombudsman has been established as an extra judicial redress um, mechanism. Um, what I would say about the European Ombudsman that was relevant in light of our research, besides the things that are already well known, is the fact that he performs the review of the activities of the EU institutions against the standard of maladministration. Somebody, a um, previous speaker said that nobody has really address today the issue of what maladministration means. I would just briefly say that uh, this concept was extremely important um, in, the context, in, in the context of our uh, research. The main question we tried to answer was whether it's just a legality review or um, more. If we look into uh, reports of um, the European Ombudsman over the time, we do find instances of maladministration, including administrative irregularities, um, avoidable delay, abuse of power. It is definitely, uh, we, we can definitely say that there is a coexistence between a legality and an extra legality review the main question that is relevant in the context of our research is whether the non-legality review is just a secondary consideration or is something more important whether it's crucial uh, to the review performed um, by the the ombudsman we also have the administrative code of good uh, of good administrative um, behavior also, it comprises a mixture of principles. Some of them overlap with uh, legal principles. There are clusters of principles that have been described in the literature as being a more of an extra legal nature. For example, principles that fall under behaving with care and consideration in um, contact with the public or regarding organizational matters. Um, another important concept that we tried to touch upon was the concept of ombuds prudence or ombuds norms. As Professor Ziller said, it's very difficult to translate it into other languages. It's the same for um, Romanian. Um, there are, in the literature, there are two main approaches. The first one, which basically says that the ombuds norms um, encompass um, and overlap to a certain degree with legal principles plus something extra. It can be ethical standards or um, a standard of proper administration. While there is a completely diverging view which says that the norms developed by the ombudsman are completely separate from the legal norms and that there is an independent body of uh, norms um, that go beyond uh, legal principles. Um, getting to the topic of the paper, if we look at the Ombudsman Institution in the context of transparency in the EU, we have the hard sources of law. Of course, there are the uh, provisions from the treaties, but the more applied specialized um, uh, regulations are listed there. Regulation uh, 1049 that, uh, from 2001, Aarhus Convention, it applies in environmental matters, and Regulation 45 uh, from 2001 on data protection. And uh, as already mentioned, there are various uh, sources of soft law that apply. The methodology was rather straightforward. 
it encompasses three steps. First, we reviewed the European Ombudsman decisions, 2010, 2015, as well as own inquiries. Step two was to provide a summary of the decisions in order to identify the alleged breaches. Um, and the final step was to look into the European Ombudsman judgment to see whether um, the legal norm or principle of good administration which was employed, whether it's specified or not. And we were also interested, as uh, mentioned in the beginning, in setting aside and making a, an inventory of the cases when the European Ombudsman clearly invoked extra legal values and principles. And I will hand the floor to my colleague who will present the main Thank you. Well, uh, I will get straight to the main findings of, uh, of our research. Uh, again, this area of freedom of information, access to public information, is one of the areas where the ombudsman can actually intervene more than in other areas and maybe construct uh, uh, some new norms or, or uh, enforce the, the existing norms in regulations or uh, coming from the case law of the Court of, uh, Court of Justice. Um, we took the main topics usually uh, discussed by scholars in um, freedom of information uh, literature and uh, topically uh, discussing them uh, as regard as regards the, the involvement of the European Ombudsman in developing new norms or existing norms in, in those fields. So, for the beginning, beneficiaries of freedom of information, who benefits from freedom of information uh, regulations? Here we have the usual uh, rules, an illegal person, citizens at the beginning, and then illegal persons. The European institutions has, have extended the rules from the regulation uh, in 2001 to any uh, natural or legal person not residing or having a registered office in a member state. Uh, the, here the extension is in place for the Council and the Commission, and the Parliament, the regular regulation of the Parliament says when possible. So there's still room for uh, a better regulation than that uh, uh, in the Parliament. The problemat more problematic uh, situation is that the agencies are bodies because there are so many and they have, some of them they have their own rules, the others are just uh, applying general regulations. Of course, the European Ombudsman has intervened in, many, in, in several cases uh, regarding the beneficiaries of freedom of information legislation. For instance, uh, um, launching an own inquiry when uh, somebody who was not, uh, who, who didn't have standing for, for addressing the Ombudsman uh, came with a, with a request. And again, I will not discuss again the Frontex case, which is uh, well known and it was discussed um, in, in depth. Documents versus information is a highly uh, debated issue in uh, comparative literature. And uh, of course, the most advanced uh, regulations in the world uh, give us access to public information, not to public documents, which means that uh, public institutions have an obligation even to compile uh, information from different doc documents when necessary. The regulation at the European Union level gives access to documents. And here the European Ombudsman has had a, a very clear um, contribution in widening the scope of the coverage of the concept of documents. This involved also um, a survey carry, carried out in 2008 and a study made uh, based on that uh, survey that defined the document very widely as including the medium uh, the content and the medium on which is, uh, is held. Uh, it was found that, that the limitation of the uh, existing practice on, on releasing documents, uh, limitation was, was re uh, related to the searches in databases. If such a search in a database is consi uh, considered a document or not, and the European Ombudsman was the first to say that 
uh, normal searches in databases are considered documents and should be released uh, as such by the European institutions. Of course, other circumstances may appear in time, but this groundbreaking uh, um, uh, determination of the European Ombudsman may help in the future uh, determinations as well. Uh, the amendments proposed in 2008 and 2011 to the regulation uh, on freedom of information are taking into consideration the development uh, uh, registered at the, by the European Ombudsman. And also we have uh, other contributions, for instance, considering uh, internal and preparatory documents and annexes to a main document as being documents in the sense of the regulation uh, 1049. The application of the petitioner uh, should be according to the, to the law sufficiently precise. And here again, the Ombudsman has had uh, some, some interventions. For instance, the requests that are cons were considered by the European institutions uh, vague or uh, uh, open-ended uh, still had to be um, answered and the, the European Ombudsman has said in many instances that this is not an excuse for the for Commission, for instance, to seek further clarification with the um, applicant. And as a good administration practice, uh, the European institutions should assist the applicants in clarifying their requests and if only a part of the request can be processed, uh, this is not a reason for just uh, denying the request of the whole document because uh, the document as a whole cannot be uh, disclosed yet. Vexatious and repetitive requests. Uh, here again, the, the practice to discontinue corresp uh, correspondence with the, with the applicants was considered as an instance of uh, maladministration, if not uh, required by the uh, specific circumstances, uh, circumstances of the cases. Of the, of the case, and the number of applications per se is not an indication of, uh, of a vexatious or repetitive uh, request because many of them can be answered uh, in a reasonable period of time by the European institutions. Again, the difference between the complex and the abusive requests <laughs> was uh, um, touched upon by the uh, European Ombudsman in, its, in his or her, her decisions. And the uh, European institutions were um, recommended to adopt uh, additional guidelines for their services uh, in this respect and give approximates of times um, in the cases where uh, longer periods of time were, were needed. Again, erroneously uh, addressed requests. We have different solutions in uh, comparative uh, uh, legal regimes regarding uh, this. Some legislations go for uh, uh, redirecting the erroneously uh, application to the uh, competent authority. The regulation in the European Union does not uh, provide for such a mechanism, but the European Ombudsman has stepped, stepped in again, saying that at least informing the applicant who is the competent authority uh, should be done by the European uh, institutions. And as a, uh, applying the code of administrative behavior, as a courtesy, uh, this should be an obligation of the, of the European institutions. The response of the European uh, institutions should be uh, clear and very well reasoned. And this is a matter of uh, dispute there because uh, a lot of cases, uh, the European Ombudsman has dealt with a lot of cases where the uh, motivation, especially regarding the rejection uh, based on some exceptions from the regulation, were, was not uh, sufficient. The communication should be done in the language of the applicant, and the tone and attitude of the staff dealing with requests was also the, the object of um, recommendations from the European Ombudsman, because this enhances the trust in public institutions and uh, also is uh, in compliance with the principle of uh, courtesy that is enshrined in the, in the Code of Administrative Behavior. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of interventions of the European Ombudsman have uh, been finalized with uh, 
granting the information that first was refused by the European institution. So as a, uh, an overall assessment, uh, these uh, interventions were, were very successful in, in um, many cases. Mainly, uh, freedom of information uh, requests are rejected based on the exceptions uh, provided in the uh, regulation from 2001. There are absolute and relative exceptions. The absolute ones are not uh, subjected to a public interest test. The, the relative ones are subjected to a public interest test, meaning that if there is a public interest in overriding public interest in disclosure, even though the um, document is covered by that exception, the public institution uh, must release the, the document. The European Ombudsman has done a great uh, job in, in, in uh, narrowing down the exceptions uh, in their interpretation by the, by the European institutions. Uh, as an example of, of good practices that were recommended by the European Ombudsman, <laughs> we can list uh, identifying all the documents pertaining to the request as a prerequisite of uh, assessing if an exception applies and uh, not using other exceptions than those strictly listed in the uh, regulation for, uh, as a reason for, for uh, refusing access to public information, such as administrative burden or, for instance, re releasing information, medical, uh, it was about the medical files, um, that if circulated would uh, mislead the public and so on. So different, uh, exceptions. Uh, another exception from the freedom of uh, access to information is the so-called non-existence of the document or what was developed in the uh, US uh, doctrine as a glomer, uh, glomer doctrine, meaning that if a sensitive information uh, may be um, withheld from disclosure by the public, inst public uh, institution. And even uh, confirming the existence of such a document or information would jeopardize the, the interests that are um, um, protected by Article 4. In that case, public institutions have the possibility to neither deny or uh, confirm the existence of, uh, of the document. The the problem here and the discussions here is if Article 9, par Paragraph 4 of the regulation entails public European institutions to resort to the Glomer Doctrine in order to say that such a document does not exist. Of course, the European Ombudsman can only verify and has uh, applied the, the, the principle of presumption of legality there because if the uh, European institution says that such document does not exist. Uh, there is that. And uh, the investigation cannot go further than uh, acknowledging, uh, acknowledging that. So there's still a discussion if that article entails for application of a Glomar doctrine or is just uh, for cases where evidently the documents that, that do not exist. Then we have partial disclosure. I will not insist on that. Of course, part of the documents should be disclosed. Sensitive documents. Here we have defense, military matters, public security, foreign policy. A lot of cases were dealt with regarding the, the foreign relations. International agreements, pending uh, uh, s signing or pending ratification. Uh, here no public interest test has to be performed. So um, again, the assessment of the European Ombudsman can only uh, relate to that. Uh, and of course, uh, we discussed already uh, here about the TTIP and the um, own investigations of the European Ombudsman regarding the trialogues. Then we have the Irish case in 2011 and 2014 from the European Central Bank on uh, financial, monetary and economic policy of the EU member states. The, the letter addressed by the bank to the Irish government regarding the economic crisis. Again, 
we can see a contribution of the European Ombudsman <laughs> even in, in, in these uh, very sensitive cases. For instance, um, recommending the European institutions that in, in sensitive cases proactive uh, dissemination of what can be released uh, may solve a lot of problems and may uh, prevent a lot of unnecessary uh, requests for, for public information. And of course, releasing the information that is already public without much, you know, procedural uh, uh, burden and so on. Another issue of, uh, very disputed uh, in practice is the third party consent. A lot of documents are originating from the member states or from other governments in, outside the Europe. And of course, the rule is that uh, European institutions should release those documents only after consulting the originating party. The problem is here to see if such a consultation may be the only reason for refusal uh, to grant the access to public information. And the European uh, Ombudsman, uh, uh, Ombudsprudence in, in such regard is that if the per third party needs to be consulted, then the European institutions should set also deadlines for answering uh, such a, a request for consultations. If the third party does not respond to, uh, to the consultation request, then the European institutions should go ahead with assessing if the documents can be released or not, and if it falls under the exception or not. Again, the third party require, uh, if the third party requires to know uh, the name of the applicant or the identity of the applicant, that is not, uh, uh, has not bearing on the case. Personal data, it's another uh, ground for um, refusing access to public information. Here we have the interplay between the two regulations, the regulation 1049 and regulation 45. There were cases where applicants were requesting uh, access to documents based on their right to access their own file, and then requesting again access to documents in order to make them public uh, uh, based on the Freedom of Information Act. So, Again, the European Ombudsman has clarified that uh, an assessment is needed every time the request uh, is based on the regulation 1049, because that would entail the, the um, applicant to make public the, the document and not only use parts of, of, of it. And again, a lot of cases dealt with the, the selection board members. The recommendation of the Ombudsman was uh, for European institution to inform when selecting the bo uh, board members uh, that their names, that their identity would be released if uh, a request for public information uh, would, uh, would occur. So this is again a contribution of the institution to the uh, good practice uh, of the European institutions. Decision making, Rota's documents, uh, internal documents, preparatory documents, uh, advice given to the deciding entities, uh, deliberations, internal rules, and so on that are covered under, under this exception. Again, the European Ombudsman went for a, a narrow interpretation of the exception. And uh, here also the European Court of Justice has, has, uh, has had some, some um, case law in which they said that uh, the burden of proof for the public interest override should uh, lay on the applicant. But the European Ombudsman uh, went a little bit uh, further and said that there is an obligation ex officio by the public, uh, by the European institution to also ra raise and assess the public interest uh, test. And here where we have uh, also a recommendation for proactive dissemination and the matter of uh, transparency register, which was, dis was discussed at the European Union level. The, the mandatory character of uh, such a register uh, was also um, mentioned. Commercial interest is one of the exceptions. Uh, of course, the case law of the 
Court of Justice uh, has already established that not all information about the company is commercially uh, sensitive. Still, a lot of refusals uh, regarding public uh, access to information are based on this commercial interest test. Uh, the European Ombudsman has uh, stressed the importance of every time and every individual case um, that, that should be, uh, the, the test, test should be performed. Uh, and the opposition of the economic operator um, regarding disclosure is not binding on the European institution. The assessment should be done um, regardless of, uh, of such op opposition. Then we have ongoing investigations and proceedings. Uh, here the concept of ongoing investigation was uh, discussed uh, because there were cases where the risk of protected interest uh, was not very clear from the beginning and was more general, hypothetical. Again, the contribution of the European Ombudsman here was that uh, the burden of proof um, should be with the uh, European institution in uh, uh, demonstrating that there is an investigation ongoing and uh, releasing the documents will jeopardize that uh, investigation. In competition cases, the European Ombudsman went a little bit further and even gave guidance on how to perform the public interest test. Uh, I will go further on time frames. A lot of uh, investigations of the um, Ombudsman deal, dealt with uh, excessive uh, delays in providing information. Uh, as a result, apologies were often uh, offered by the, by the European institutions and were a systematic uh, structural uh, failure to, to deal with the requests uh, was uh, occurring. The European Ombudsman uh, launched own inquiries and investigations and um, uh, went with, with recommendations. Uh, again, just a mention about a clear contribution of the institution to how the regulation is interpreted. The regulation 1049 does not have any provision on the deadlines for confirmatory application in case of silence of uh, European institutions. Well, the European Ombudsman says that uh, at any time the applicants can go for confirmatory <laughs> applications. Of course, this is not uh, very much agreed by the European institutions, but still uh, an example of uh, good, good, practi uh, good practice. The overall assessment, or a preliminary assessment, because we still need some, some work to do on the, on the findings. The European Ombudsman Institution is, uh, in this respect of, of contributing to the uh, freedom of information uh, development in the European Union, uh, is performing a legality review, mainly, infused with uh, good administration behavior um, principles and, uh, and practices. By adopting the code of administrative behavior, uh, the contribution to the enhancement of freedom of information is, is very clearly uh, stated. Uh, mainly the institution is regarded as a redress mechanism, uh, as an alternative to court to the European Court of Justice in, um, in freedom of information cases because uh, in, in most of the cases the institution uh, tries to enforce the already established case law uh, of the court in, in that regard. The European Institu uh, Ombudsman has uh, contributed to, to the enforcement of the idea of performing the interest test, the public interest test at every occasion when uh, um, an exclusion grounds uh, is invoked, and systematic failures in dealing with freedom of information cases were addressed by the European inst um, institution, the, the European Ombudsman, by own inquiries and uh, visits at the uh, sites of the European uh, institutions. So our preliminary uh, assessment is that in this area, at least, the European Ombudsman has developed new norms of, of good governance, apart from those already uh, um, in, 
enforceable at the level of the regulation and the, the, the case law, and is making a clear mark on the, the development of the freedom of information regime in the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we are all looking forward to more details in the paper, also in order to understand not only to what extent a corpus of ombudsman's is established, but also if you have some data about how uh, the institutions comply, which is probably far more difficult, but where the methods of sociologists might help. Uh, I'm opening the floor for questions, comments. So I'll start with one uh, which is probably useful to take in mind that um, amongst the results of uh, ombudsprudence, we have a, a source which sometimes our colleagues, lawyers, do not consider enough, but a source which is extremely useful for two type of, of issues. One is understanding what are the real issues which do not come to the court because there's no standing. And we cannot blame the court not to decide on questions where there's an understanding. But uh, the other is indeed that we have an, a number of, of uh, alternative rules. And when trying to codify something or to compare different uh, uh, established regulations in, uh, in uh, um, secondary law, we found out that there are divergences and that the uh, ombudsman might be helpful. Obviously, as you've chosen to uh, look at access to documents, it's uh, giving a very strong framework, which maybe is not easy to transpose to, to other aspects, but I think Joanna Mendes will, uh, will speak of uh, other points. My remark is one thing that probably it would be interesting to look at uh, the difference between access to documents as such and access to the file, where you have a far, far more uh, complex, I would say, jurisprudence of the court, uh, and where uh, indeed uh, uh, the duty of, of care uh, implies that you uh, sometimes reverse the burden of the proof, which is not exactly the same thing as in the framework of, of uh, and the regulation on access to documents. It was just a, a remark en passant. Uh, Ian Hardy. Another remark en, en passant, as it were. Um, I, th I think it, it, it's very important to, to bear in mind that when the general court is dealing with an access to documents case, the practical question that the court faces is, shall we annul the decision of the institution? And that's the only practical question that it faces, really. Um, since the ombudsman can't annul the decision, that's never the practical question facing the ombudsman, which in one way means the ombudsman is a, is a weaker institution than the court because it can't annul, but on the other hand, it means the ombudsman has a lot more possibilities to do things which be precisely because the ombudsman does not have to take uh, a binding, cannot take a binding position, this is legal, this is not legal. The Ombudsman can, give, can and does give a view on legality, but it's, it's never binding. So that opens up new possibilities for the Ombudsman. And in particular, there are a number of cases um, where the Ombudsman has effectively said, I'm, I'm a crude paraphrase, uh, never mind about whether your initial refusal of access was justified or not, please release the document now. Can't you release it now? And that, that, that's something which, which is not really open to, to, to the court. So it's an additional contribution, I think, of, of the Ombudsman. Yes, I would just like to add that this is, of course, a, exactly a, a very, very difficult and dangerous territory to be in because the Court of Justice has um, arguably gone very far in excluding whole areas uh, from access to documents, not access to file, but access to documents, whole scale in competition, state aid matters, where it's very questionable whether 
that really complies with the, um, the, 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 the spirit of the law and whether that serves the public interest so well. So the, the alternative redress through ombudsman, I think, becomes ever more important when we come to very far-reaching case law simply saying, no matter what the black letter law says, in the order of good administration, we think competition cases should be fairly um, outside of the uh, access to documents uh, as far as uh, ongoing or former, I mean, on ongoing investigations, obviously, but, but also former investigations go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thiele. Uh, I was uh, very pleased by uh, the introductions of uh, Bogdana and uh, Dacian, and especially the uh, combination of the two uh, contributions, because um, if we read the, the summary, um, uh, Bogdana lays stress on uh, the, the fact that um, the ombudsman, ombudsprudence, is not about the law, but about more ethical uh, norms, etc., etc. And in the second uh, contribution, you showed that in the field of uh, access to documents, this is highly, this is highly important. And uh, Ian Harden also uh, uh, elaborated on this issue that you, as the, the European Ombudsman, can go further. And for that reason, I think it's, it's relevant to reflect on the meaning of a wording like uh, Ombuds prudence, because it's, it's almost similar to US prudence. But the working of it is completely different. So on the one hand, it's helpful to understand what is happening here. There, they are, the, the ombudsman uh, brings uh, rules to the, to the world, to the administration. But on the other hand, the meaning of those rules is completely, not, not completely, but is different from. So I think it's highly interesting to, to, to make a combination just of the reflections of Bogdana in the general uh, perspective and the more specialized perspective of uh, openness of doc documents. What's the meaning of when the, the two, two stories meet each other? And I think that's the strength of the Ombudsman, that the Ombudsman is not strictly limited to legal observations, but he can go further. And uh, for that reason, I think that the code of good administrative behavior is highly important for not only questions of legality and for good administration and bad administration, but also bridging uh, the gap in direction of uh, good governance and uh, accountability. One thing, and then if you want to, uh, I would say here, uh, thinking as a future co-editor, co there are two points which uh, uh, could be uh, stressed probably in, in your paper. One is uh, the fact that in this matter, the European Ombudsman has a very specific role based on the regulation. Uh, and as you uh, have done a lot of comparative work, you know well that in some countries there's this rule for the ombudsman. In some others, there's a speci specific authority, and it might be interesting to think about uh, to what, what extent the output of what the uh, ombudsman on access to document is is due to this uh, double double hat. Uh, th that's, I think, a, a first uh, element. The second one, we, we uh, were demanded this morning, and again now of the uh, Bav Bavarian Lager uh, saga, and the interesting point is that you had here an issue where the Ombudsman and the European Data Protection Supervisor agreed. And th that's worthwhile looking at maybe a little bit more, and it's linked also to the, your paper about the authorities of uh, accountability. Now, if you want to uh, say something in order to conclude, uh, um, both uh, Dacian and Bogdana. Yes, thank you very much for your uh, comments. Yes, we. Uh, the presentation uh, was short because of the deadline, but we already uh, in the in the draft uh, paper we addressed this issue. That Article Eight of the regulation uh, says that uh, when when uh, um, reasoning a, a decision for uh, for refusal, for instance, uh, to access uh, to public information, the uh, European institutions are obliged to to indicate the European Ombudsman as a redress mechanism. Uh, 
along with the courts. So this is a clear incentive for going to the ombudsman, maybe more than in other cases, because there is there in the in the regulation. So of course uh, the regulation uh, in freedom of information is a clear uh, help for for involving the European ombudsman in. In, in this. And uh, of course, uh, the discussion uh, about the data protection and the interplay between uh, freedom of uh, information is a very complex one and is going to be uh, treated uh, accordingly in our, in our paper. There are uh, very interesting cases uh, regarding this uh, identified in the, in the um, case of the, of the European Ombudsman. I also wa want to refer to the competition issues. It's uh, a very uh, straightforward uh, example of how the European Ombudsman can intervene in such cases. For instance, in, in cases where the information cannot be released uh, because it was covered by the, by the exceptions, the European Ombudsman said that uh, sh European institutions should find alternative uh, ways of uh, uh, releasing the information. For instance, instructing the applicant who was uh, in a pending procedure before a national court to ask the court, the national court, for for um, for a request for inf for information, which is allowed under the the um, regulations on on competition on competition law. So the national court can obtain that information. The applicant, as an individual, cannot. So if there is an alternative way of uh, getting that information, that should be. Um, specified by the European institution as a matter of good practice in competition law cases. So this was clearly an example of how creative can be the institution of uh, European Ombudsman in giving the solutions to, to, to different uh, applications, which are kind of stuck, you know, cannot go against the written rules, against the, the, the law in, in those cases. Thank you. Thank you.